Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our caregivers webinar this evening. I am so happy to be co-hosting this with Sadia from the Kidney Foundation. My name is Candice. I'm from the Center for Living Organ Donation, and I am also a kidney transplant recipient myself. So I have had some remarkable caregivers throughout my journey as well. And so I wanted to take a moment to say happy National Caregiver Day today. We are so grateful that you're all here. Before we begin, I would love to introduce our co-host, Sadia. Welcome. Thank you so much. Hi. Uh, thank you, Candice. It's always lovely to co-host with you. This is not our first rodeo. Um, <laughs> so my name is Sadia, and I'm from the Kidney Foundation. I'm one of the program coordinators. And like Candice, I'm also a kidney patient for the past 25-ish years. Um, and yeah, lots of experience working with our caregivers. They're amazing. They're phenomenal. And the fact that caregivers come in so many different varieties of caregiving, um, we want to acknowledge and respect and just show the passion that we have towards the impact that they have on so many of our lives as patients and everyone else um, feeling supported by them. So with that being said, I pass it over to Candice to get us started. Awesome. So tonight we're going to hear from a couple caregivers and they're going to share their journeys with caregiving and uh, how they have gone through all of this. And although being a caregiver never stops, um, their journey has changed. And so they're going to talk about um, different tips and things like that that they have used and uh, you'll hear him, them share. And then later we, we will hear from Shrid from the Ontario Caregivers Association. A very busy day for them today being the National Caregiver Day. So we're very grateful to have him with us as well today. And then at the end of the event, we'll hear a little bit from Saudia as well about what the Kidney Foundation has to offer caregivers and their families. And then we'll open it up to Q&A. So without further ado, we would love to have Rob join us and share a little bit about his journey as a caregiver. Welcome, Rob. Yes, good afternoon. My name is Rob Ray Harris. I'm the husband of Tamara Harris, which is a transplant recipient. My journey with my wife, I met her. We've been married for over 12 years now. You know, on our journey of marriage, about a year and a half after we had a son together. And just as we had a son together, he was about six months old. Sorry, one minute. He was about six months old when I, uh, when she was told that um, she had uh, diabetes. She had kidney failure, sorry. I knew she had diabetes when we got married, but I didn't know anything about that. It was new to me because where I came from, they call it, they never used to call it diabetes, they call it sugar. So it was new to me and I didn't know how to cope with it. I watched her struggle, giving herself, missing the insulin to herself every day. So when I saw that, it was kind of disturbing to me because I got scared. I didn't know that it was just, give yourself the insulin and you'll be okay. So as we journeyed on the, along with that, I was comfortable with that after a while. And on, after that, she had to take, um, she was told that her kidneys was failing and she had to do, um, he, hemo, hemodialysis. And um, that's when I was like, what is going on here? I don't know anything about this. What's, what's happening to my wife? And I got a little bit scared at that time because there was no one to explain anything to me. And I didn't know, like I said, I didn't know anything. So I got scared. Maybe she went on to do the dialysis. I had my son at the time when he was little and I was working at the time. So every day, she had to do the, every, every other night, she had to do the dialysis. She was doing it at home. So it was a little bit easier at the time. So after that one morning, my wife woke up and she said to me that she wasn't feeling so great. So I said to her, I said, okay, go to the shower, have a shower, maybe you feel better after. She went to the shower, she had a shower. She came back, she said, I can't see. So I said, what do you mean you can't see? She said, I can't see, and she had this headache. So I decided, okay, we're gonna settle down and about two hours after, she said she still had the same feeling. 
had decided I'm going to take her to the hospital. I took her to the hospital. They, at the moment, they didn't find anything. So they said to me, they're going to keep her overnight to see if anything would go wrong. About seven o'clock the following morning, they phoned me and they said, my wife is not doing well. I should come to the hospital immediately. I went to Humber River. When I got there, I found my wife in a coma. And she said, to, the doctor said to me, in the night season, she had some seizures. So I'm like, what happened here? I had my son, I had my job. I had nobody to take care of my son at the present moment. So I said, okay, we're gonna stay a couple, maybe she come a couple of days, everything's gonna be fine. Because it happened, not she went into a coma before, but she went into the hospital before. And she came out and everything was fine. So two weeks pass, the doctors are not saying anything to me. They're just saying that, you know, she's getting worse. So I, I'm starting to get frightened now. I had to quit my job. And my son was like six months old. I had to take care of him, take care of her, myself. She's been in the hospital. She was there for four months. Out of the four months, the first two months, she was in a coma. So I went to the hospital every day, take care of my son, take care of myself, and the business around my scene. It was... so hard to watch her every day because I went to the hospital every day to watch her. But I'm a strong believer in, I'm a very religious man. And my religion kept me going because I kept hanging on to that, knowing that it's a bright ending. So the time she was there, things deteriorated a little bit. Like I saw they were trying to resuscitate her heart was like coming out from her chest. One day I was standing there, her heart was like coming out of her chest. So they had to re resuscitate her. Another time I went back, she was like in the same position. Then I, when I went back for the third time, I saw she had a trait, she couldn't speak or anything. So I'm like, I'm getting frightened of the time when I was getting frightened. And, um, then they told me that she has to, um, or she has heart problems. I never knew she had heart problems. She never knew it either. She developed heart problems. She was laying on the bed for so long, nobody was moving her, so she couldn't walk. She couldn't speak, she had to write. After she came out of coma, she couldn't speak, she had to be writing. And for me to understand what she was saying, the first time she came out, I was standing there, and she looked at me, she goes, what are you doing here? And I'm like, yes, I'm your husband. She like, I don't have a husband. I'm like, what? I said, here's your children. She goes, I don't have no children. Go. So I'm like, okay. So I called the nurse and said to the nurse, something's wrong with her. The nurse said, she's kind of hallucinating. Leave her alone in a couple of days, everything will be fine. So I went back again and she, she got a trait. She couldn't speak. And I'm saying like, what is going on? In the meantime, I am getting tired. I have no job. I have my son. And I have to go to the hospital every day. So I decided, okay, I'm going to seek some help. So I started speaking to the doctor. The doctor said to me, I would like to speak to you. And, he, and I said to him, okay, he pulled me aside and he said to me, I've been watching you coming here every day so after a month. I've been watching you coming every day and you need to take care of yourself. Otherwise you're going to get sick if you don't do something about that. So I said to him, I said, what, what do you recommend I do? He goes, just calm down what you're doing, do less and be more positive in what you're doing. Right? So I said, okay, I just, that's the one that helped me along the way to be more positive and give me strength. After that four months she was there, nobody would move her so she couldn't walk. She came to the hospital after four months. She came home, I have to lift her everything to do. I have to lift her up to the bathroom to bring her to the, run to the balcony to get some breeze to take her to the hospital, I gotta lift her up. And just my faith, it was getting stronger when I see some my wife came out of that coma that made me a little bit stronger so I can, I had a little bit more ease in myself knowing that she's getting better, she's out of that coma. So the strength, I don't know where it came from. I knew at then I had to be strong when I saw my wife got fit. I had to be strong and I had to save the thing that I loved the most, the best, which was my wife. I had to try
sorry, my very best to see and to stay by your side and stay with myself. That sorry, sorry. I get very emotional when I speak about it because it's not tears of sorrow, it's tears of joy because I love my wife and I see her. She's very good right now. And when I speak about it, I know I love her so much to see that all I've done, it came like nothing I've done. All of that I've done came like nothing and my wife is okay now. My heart is filled with joy. And these are tears of joy to say, yes, I have done my part and she appreciates it. And I appreciate them, the children, they appreciate it. And everybody's stable right now. But it was an easy task. It was very, very rough. Very rough. But rough as in good rough. Because I came, it, it motivated me. Because some days I went to the hospital. When I got there, the nurses, everybody knew me. Everybody was like, okay, Mr. Harris is here. I took her off the bed. I made the bed and tidy her up and everything. And they just let me do that because I was comfortable doing it. I felt comfortable doing it for her because I knew that's what she wanted. And she acknowledged that I was doing it, so I was happy. But like I said, my faith kept me, my faith kept me alive. Every day I went and I went faithfully because that was my heart's well desire to do that for my loving wife, which I love dearly. And I don't want people to feel that it was, uh, at first I felt it was, it, I didn't even feel like it was a burden to me, never felt it was a burden to me. I just knew that I had to do what I had to do. And what I had to do strengthened me to know that she's gonna get better. She wasn't getting worse, she was getting better. So it gave me the courage and the strength some days when I look at my wife, she came down to 80 pounds. And when I looked at her and I saw that smile in her face, she still had it. And I knew that that was strength for me and strength for her and healing for her also and healing for myself. So I want to thank, there were people around me that encouraged me first of all like I said the doctor was the first one that saw what was happening that I didn't know that that was something that was happening around me he saw and he helped me and the people at the dialysis center they were great people they were great great people that every day they saw me they put a smile on my face and that was that was the courage that, that lifts me up when I brought her they was they were so good on a day when things, she started to feel better when they called her for the transplant that morning, they called with an unknown number. So I did unknown number they were calling and telling, talking, you know, these crank calls they get. So I didn't want to answer the phone. At the end I said, okay, I'm going to answer this phone in the afternoon. And I heard Toronto General, my heart skipped a beat. I said to my wife right away, I said, here, I was cooking. I said, here, the phone. And they said, you got to come right away. I put aside everything. And I jumped for joy and I went to that hospital. When I went there, the people, I was there, they were so uplifting. It wasn't a moment that it was sad because they were their reassurance that everything is going to be okay. Twice she'd been called before that. And it was like, you were, you're not ready. She was so weak and she wasn't ready. It was sad, but I said to her, let's have the faith. It's going to happen. When it happened, it's going to be signed and sealed and everything would be okay. So that day, it was joy. When I went back the following day to the hospital and I saw my wife was awake and she said, hi. I was like, wow, this is it. How great thou art. That's what I said. And I got that joy. My heart was filled. When she came home, it was a desire to take care of her because better was there. Better was there. So, I thank all the people that helped me. I didn't see him at the time like I needed help, but I needed the help because I was going and putting up a front that everything was okay. Mm -hmm. 
I had to because I was going to fall apart if I didn't do that. I, like I said, I had to give up my job, which was important to me. I had, at the, at the time, I hadn't a fixed income, but I didn't care about income, really. I All I cared, I could foresee was my wife was ill and she had to get better. And I didn't want my son to go without the mother. So I worked hard with the grace of my God that I serve, and he helped me through all of this. And I am grateful today. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Wow, that is quite the journey, Rob. Thank you so much for joining us today and for for sharing uh, everything that you and your family have been through and the strength that you had together as a family to to keep going. And I'm so happy, you know, for for your situation that it uh, that you are all doing really really well. So. Thank you for joining us today to share your remarkable journey and thank you for everything you did for, for your family and your incredible wife, Tamara. We really appreciate everything you do and everything all of our caregivers do. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'll thank pass you. it over to Sadia. Okay, awesome. Um, I am sharing my screen um, just for a little while, but um, I'd like to introduce our next amazing caregiver who is Kristen who's gonna share a little bit uh, about her journey as a parent caregiver to her daughter, Lily. So over to you, Kristen. Thank you, Sadia. Rob, I just have to say your story is so inspirational. And every time I hear anybody talk about kitty disease, there's always so many parallels. I can always relate to something, I'm sure. Once you hear my, I don't want to, anyway, I always just want to chat, <laughs> but I'll go ahead and, and I'll tell, uh, tell our story. So I find it really difficult to talk about being a caregiver as a parent, because I've always been a caregiver to my children. Being a parent is a caregiver. So I have two children. Lily is uh, currently age 11 and Foster's 14. You can see in the picture, this is this is um, when she was diagnosed. So here she's seven and he was 10. Um, at their current ages, they're quite independent. They're wonderful. They're happy children. Um, but Lily has kidney disease. She's had a kidney transplant. Lily has a G-tube and she's been on dialysis in the past. I'm her primary caregiver and I'm really lucky. I have a husband in this picture and he's her caregiver as well. So there's two of us. I don't know how single parents do it with kidney disease. <laughs> we are very lucky um, that since her kidney disease, I'm able to work part-time. At the time of her diagnosis, Lily spent three months in the hospital. I saw a parallel to Rob's story there. Um, I stopped working. And uh, just like Rob said, that completely changed my world. Um, just saying that, just saying I stopped working um, reminds me how much it changed my world. Work was part and still is part of my identity. I'm a teacher. Um, I've been a teacher since I was 21 years old. So I've been a teacher for over 20 years and it's who I am. Um, before the diagnosis, um, I was thinking of being a principal or a vice principal. I was going to take the course in three months from the time that she got sick. Um, I know many caregivers who've had to stop working or change their jobs to take care of their loved ones. So it really, it impacts everything we do. Um, and I'm okay with it now. I have no interest in being a principal or vice principal now. And I laugh because I'm okay with that. And I think it's taken me down another path. And I love my job now. I love how it's changed over the last three years. So it's all worked out. Um, it's difficult. It affects everything. Lily was on dialysis for a year and a half. So she was diagnosed, she was in the hospital for three and a half months. The doctors tried everything to get her disease, um, her FSGS to stop spilling protein and to get her kidneys um, into remission. Um, they weren't able to. They weren't able to stop the disease no matter what they tried and they tried really hard. Um, so uh, she ended up on dialysis uh, within nine months of the diagnosis. There was just no way to stop it. Um, so at eight years old, she was on dialysis three times a week and very quickly four times a week. I was there every day. 
my husband uh, started working two jobs at the time to help make ends meet. Um, we weren't sure I was going to get an income. At first, I was denied um, an income from my insurance and my employer. Um, we were lucky that we were able to get um, an income from my insurance, but until we knew if that was going to turn out, he worked two jobs and we still had a son that someone needed to care for. <laughs> um, so there was a lot, there was a lot going on. We're lucky that he didn't need to work the two jobs permanently, but he did do it for a year. Um, once she had her transplant, um, uh, I was able to return to work part-time and he was able to stay working uh, one job. Um, so yeah, Lily had the dialysis for a year and a half. COVID happened in the middle of all of that. And then uh, she had her transplant in March of 2021. With Lily's disease, uh, FSGS, the hope is that it won't return after transplant. It did return after transplant. So, and her transplant, we live in Ottawa. Her transplant happened in Toronto. So myself, my husband and Lily went to Toronto. We were supposed to be there for eight to 10 days. My husband was the donor. Um, they recommend that you bring a caregiver with you for the donor, but it was COVID. So he walked himself into the hospital and I walked Lily across the street into her hospital. And two days later, he walked out by himself with his suitcase to the hotel. She went into ICU and was not doing well. So I stayed in the ICU with her for four days on my own. I didn't sleep for the first two days because I wouldn't leave her and we didn't have anybody to give us a break. We didn't feel comfortable asking anyone um, during the height of COVID to um, come to another city and stay with us. That was our own personal um, comfort level. And really, honestly, it just was where our support system was. Um, it is what it is. Um, luckily, um, the donor, my husband did really well and he was okay on his own. We did have an emergency plan. <laughs> we did have backup support that we could call if we needed someone to come to Toronto for him. Um, Lily's disease did recur. And we ended up spending 28 days in Toronto, not eight to 10. Um, so uh, how it works during COVID with um, staying in a different city is, and I think there are different resources for um, different levels, but as a donor, my husband had some financial access. So he had a hotel available and we used the hotel for him and then when the hotel was no longer available and we were told that we would be in Toronto for up to three months that did change we applied for Ronald McDonald House because during COVID Ronald McDonald House was not available for a less than two week stay and eight to ten days is less than two weeks so we moved into Ronald McDonald House Unfortunately, and fortunately, if you're going to be in Ronald McDonald House during COVID, you need to have anyone who's going to stay with you there the very first day you walk in the doors. My son was in a different city. So if we wanted to see my son at all within those three months, he needed to be there on the first day. So our wonderful and incredible support system drove him in Ottawa to get a PCR test. Then another wonderful part of our support system drove him five hours to Toronto with a full car of groceries that we didn't know was coming, dropped him off at our hotel. We walked to Ronald McDonald House and he moved in with us for the final two weeks of our stay. And then they transferred her care back to Ottawa um, once she was stable enough to finish her um, for it did end up being four months of treatment, but they were comfortable transferring the last three months to Ottawa. They just weren't sure how stable she would be. So having a support system and asking for help when you need the help, it is hard. It is really hard. I don't like asking for help. I don't know a lot of people who do like asking for help, but the idea of being separated from my son for three months, I'm going to ask for help. I did ask for help. 
Uh, I called in the big favors. <laughs> uh, so I went on, that was kind of our journey in a nutshell. It's a lot to have when you have, you know, more than one child or even a child in general, just like with Rob, you know, yeah. you focus on who do you focus on, right? Yeah. And it's as a caregiver, you have to equally focus on everyone. So honestly, like that's amazing that your support system supported you with foster so much. And the little things like bringing you groceries, that makes a huge, huge difference. Huge. Right. Yeah. And so kudos to your support system that like they didn't even ask and they just went ahead and did it from the goodness of their heart to support you. So that's awesome. Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing, Kristen. That was uh, a whirlwind to listen to as, as a parent. I can't even imagine going through what, what your family has. And we're so grateful for you being so vulnerable and open and sharing with us today. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions for both you and Rob as well through, through tonight. So um, thank you for sharing. And, and I would love to ask Shrid if he could turn on his video and uh, join us as well. Shrid is from the Ontario Caregivers Organization, and uh, he's going to talk to us today about the Ontario Caregivers Organization and some of the resources that, that they provide and uh, a little bit about who they are. So I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We are incredibly grateful for your time. Thank you very much, Candice, for having me and Thalia. Um, Rob and Kristen, thank you very much for sharing your stories. I know we hear from caregivers all the time and a lot of what we do is shaped by your stories and uh, we really want to focus on understanding uh, caregiver needs and kind of help um, build more uh, provincial awareness in terms of programming and funding as, uh, as it pertains to caregiver needs as well. And I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit uh, in the presentation as well. So I'm gonna quickly share my screen and um, I see you, Candice, so if you can give me a thumbs up, then I know that you are seeing the perfect. Okay, great. So yeah, so as Candice mentioned, I'm coming to you from the Ontario Caregiver Organization. My role within the organization is uh, of a project lead in partnerships and innovation. So I work uh, with other um, organizations that have some sort of caregiver programming to kind of see how we can align our efforts to make sure that we're able to uh, reach caregivers across the province. Um, <clears throat> today is National Caregiver Day, April 4th, uh, the first Tuesday of every April, and the theme for this year's um, event, uh, uh, um, Caregiver Day, was around celebrating a caregiver. So uh, we spoke with multiple caregivers and we've had uh, discussions with um, caregivers around what it means to be celebrated and uh, caregivers have lent their voices to in, 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 in different ways through social media and also through uh, a live event this morning uh, that you can go and access through the Caregiver Day landing page on our website. And I'll be happy to share that um, um, uh, link for the landing page uh, at the end of the presentation as well. So let's start by defining uh, Ontario's caregivers. So uh, this is a question we get asked uh, from a lot of individuals because a huge part of what we do is around also um, helping with that self-realization piece for a lot of individuals who may not see themselves as caregivers. So we define family caregivers as any family member, friends or neighbors who is providing care to someone in an unpaid capacity. And it could be due to any of the reasons you see on the screen. Uh, we have a range of different new caregivers entering the fray, especially now because of maybe complications resulting from COVID-19. And we heard a little bit around that as well, right? So we help provide supports to anyone who identifies as a caregiver and someone who needs support. So when we're looking at it from a number standpoint, we know that there are about 4 million caregivers across Ontario, and these include young caregivers. So young caregivers are typically de defined um, as those below the age of 25. Uh, we know that uh, a huge percentage of caregivers are between the age of 26 and 63, who also identify as being part of that sandwiched generation, wherein they're taking care of someone older while also having responsibilities towards young individuals at home. Uh, caregivers are evenly split when it comes to gender identity, but primarily are female. And a large number of caregivers say that they're employed but now, especially because of the pandemic and all of the vulnerabilities associated with the pandemic, uh, we've had a lot of caregivers say that they're finding it 
more challenging balancing work and caregiving where they may be sitting at a desk in front of a laptop working while also uh, having someone who is laying down next to them and they're taking care of that person simultaneously where so work and caregiving have kind of just gelled into one activity. So um, when we're looking at uh, the top responsibility for caregivers, like what are they actually doing? Who are they caring for? Uh, they say that um, uh, a large number of caregivers are actually taking care of someone who is an older family member or a parent. Uh, and the top responsibility that caregivers provide is around offering emotional supports, uh, offering behavioral supports, uh, especially when there's something like responsive behaviors involved, offering physical supports, uh, such as lifting, moving, um, moving from bed to chair to um, bathroom, uh, into the car, so a range of physical supports. Uh, caregivers offer basic medical tasks, such as administering and managing medications. But now, because of the pandemic and because of, uh, again, the vulnerabilities associated with having professionals come into the home, we've had a lot of caregivers talk about how they've taken on more complex or heavy, heavier caregiving responsibilities, uh, such as giving injections, um, changing catheters, changing wound packages, um, doing a lot of those blood tests uh, as well at home. So caregivers are having to take on a lot of these responsibilities and which has caused a lot of caregivers to say that they are um, close to or already at burnout. Uh, so about 63% of caregivers across the province talk about being burnt out. And uh, we have some programs that kind of help with that as well. So I'll, I'll talk about that as we go. So what is it that we do? So we are the Ontario Caregiver Organization. We are a relatively new organization and our main purpose is to offer supports to anyone who identifies as a caregiver. We were established the spring of 2018 um, and we're funded by the Ministry of Health. So all of our directives come from the Ministry of Health. And uh, we continually seek information and feedback from caregivers so that we can uh, take that information through the proper chain of command uh, to the ministry level so that, like I mentioned, future funding and future programs uh, reflect those needs that are identified by caregivers themselves. So um, we work towards uh, improving the awareness and recognition of the contribution and importance of caregivers, recognizing that uh, based on where caregivers are across the country, they contribute uh, immensely to the healthcare system. Um, uh, when we're looking at it from a monetary standpoint, we know that it, they could be from anywhere from 26 to $72 billion in healthcare money. So that is a huge, huge contribution. So we work with the general public and anyone to kind of talk about who caregivers are and what they do and how important it is for us to support them uh, in, in their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, we connect with caregivers regardless, uh, con with, connect caregivers with information that supports regardless of age, condition, or location. So we are province-wide. Um, we really don't even ask for a diagnosis. Anybody who identifies as a caregiver, we, we help uh, support them as well. Um, and uh, we support all age groups. We have a young caregiver program as well, for example. Um, another part of what we do is we're, we work with system partners to kind of understand uh, what's already out there and see how system partners can better align their efforts so that there is less duplication of services and better transition for caregivers to transfer from one program to the next or one agency to the next without having to go through 50 different intake processes, for example. So if we're able to have um, um, uh, more meaningful partnerships with different organizations who work and serve caregivers in one location, for example, then we're able to better have those transitions in terms of warm transfers, for example, for caregivers from one agency to the next or one program to the next as well. And then we have multiple opportunities for caregivers to um, you know, provide feedback and talk about their experiences and identify gaps in service needs as well, which again, I'll talk to, I'll speak to when, when, when uh, uh, towards the end of the presentation. So right off the bat, um, we talk about that self-realization piece for a lot of caregivers. For a lot of individuals who go into a doctor's appointment, for example, um, and then come out with a diagnosis, 
they really don't see themselves as caregivers for the most part uh, because they might be just, oh, I'm, I'm the husband. I'm supposed to take care of my wife or like Rob mentioned, or I'm the mother. I'm, it's my duty to take care of my son uh, or daughter, sorry, like, like Kristen mentioned. So um, we found uh, that a lot of caregivers don't access immediate supports because they don't see themselves as caregivers. And if they don't see themselves as caregivers, they don't know that they might need some additional support. So right off the bat, we have this toolkit called I Am A Caregiver Toolkit, which really speaks to what it means to be a caregiver, what to expect around caregiving, what conflicts may arise during caregiving, uh, and what things you need to be prepared for when it comes to caregiving. Uh, the toolkit offers a worksheet on how to build a better support team. So it, it lists a range of different activities that you may be involved as a caregiver, that you may not be involved in them uh, with all of the activities at the same time or at the beginning, but it offers you an insight into what you can expect. And based on those different activities, really help build a support team that can help you with your needs as well. Uh, it offers a self-assessment to see how how you may be coping as a caregiver throughout the caregiving process. And uh, as that uh, caregiving responsibilities, as those responsibilities change, because the care recipient situation changes or the dynamics of that um, disease changes, then we ask that the caregiver go back and do the self-assessment over time to see how they may be coping emotionally and seek the appropriate services and the appropriate help that they need based on the score from the self-assessment. So I invite you to go, if you have not seen this um, uh, toolkit, to go onto that link and, and uh, download the toolkit and see if you can um, you know, do the self-assessment for yourself as well. Uh, I'll be happy to share these slides uh, with Candice after so that she can send it out to everyone who's on here as well. And then I spoke a little bit around uh, you know, how it's, we've heard from caregivers saying that it's become very difficult to manage that caregiving and their work. And a lot of caregivers having to leave their jobs because of caregiving, uh, like Rob mentioned. So we worked with the Canadian Mental Health Association to create this toolkit around balancing work and caregiving. It offers tips um, on how you as a caregiver can speak to um, uh, employers around what it means to be a caregiver so that employers can take the necessary steps to ensure that you can be the most productive employee while also being the best version of caregivers that you can be, right? So um, there are five uh, key steps for making it work at work. And this care, uh, this toolkit really highlights those uh, those different uh, steps and, uh, and you know uh, teaches caregivers on how to initiate those conversations in their workplace as well. On the flip side, we have a toolkit for senior management, leadership, and HR on proactively taking steps uh, to you know at a policy level to make sure that uh, workplaces are more caregiver friendly as well. Uh, we offer uh, information in a range of different uh, me, uh, 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 channels. We have our website, ontariocaregiver.ca. Uh, we have the youngcaregiversconnect.ca, which is a website for young caregivers be below the age of 25. We have monthly e-newsletters and a quarterly e-bulletin for care providers. And we're also available through all of the different uh, social media platforms. So if you're able to follow on any, uh, follow us on um, Facebook or Instagram, then please uh, feel free to do so as well. And then on a public facing front around that idea of um, making people aware of who caregivers are and the challenges that they face and why is it important for us to support them, we have a podcast that um, is uh, run by caregivers themselves, where caregivers identify the topics that they want to have discussions on, and then invite subject matter experts to have those discussions. So we have three seasons uh, available through uh, this podcast, which you can download either through Spotify, Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, so any of the major podcast providers, and it discusses different topics like what it means to be a caregiver, how do you manage money, how do you get a good night's sleep, so uh, disturbed sleep patterns is something that we hear from caregivers across the board, and there's more um, research tying in a physical, mental, emotional well-being to a good 
um, sleep habits. So that's one of the big t- the, uh, uh, topics that re- that's a really popular topic among uh, among caregivers as well. So yeah, feel free to go and download this podcast as well if you're able to, and you can listen to it at your own time as well. I should also mention that because we're 100% min- uh, funded by the ministry, everything we offer is free of charge and is available at no cost. Again, from, uh, from feedback we received from caregivers around, um, you know, sometimes when they're requesting information from their social worker or their uh, doctor, they were handed uh, either lengthy articles or uh, articles filled with a lot of medical jargon in them. Uh, we reached out to uh, a Canadian um, uh, uh, psychologist who kind of specializes in creating succinct health information in more um, and uh, easy to understand language in very, uh, so that anybody can understand that language. So um, uh, the you can subscribe to this caregiver letter. It's called the 90 second caregiver letter, which as the name suggests, you can read in 90 seconds. And it, it discusses different topics such as um, family dynamics or understanding uh, conflict between, between um, uh, two siblings who may be, uh, having two different viewpoints in terms of caregiving uh, or a range of different topics that you get in your inbox once a week, once you subscribe. Uh, it takes 90 seconds to read. And once you do read it, if you're interested in finding out more, there are clickable, actionable items and caregiver stories as well, testimonials that you can read to find out more on that particular topic as well. So if if, if you're looking to find, uh, you know, get, uh, get tips on every week or on different caregiving uh, topics, please uh, sign up for uh, uh, this, this newsletter as well. And then with that idea of uh, being able to support caregivers across the province, being that one-stop shop for information and services, we have the Ontario Caregiver Helpline. So the helpline is a 24-7 system navigation resource. It is not a crisis intervention resource. So if you do have a crisis, I wouldn't encourage you to call this number. But if you're looking for system navigation help, if you're looking for supports for the person you're caring for or the supports for yourself, I encourage you to call this helpline. Um, the helpline is available in English and French uh, 24-7 and also has interpretation services in 150 different languages. Uh, it's Ontario-wide. It's in partnership with 211 Ontario and we train staff from 211 to kind of respond to those caregiver-based inquiries and be community resource specialists. There is a live chat option also available uh, through our website uh, from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m. as well. And then uh, from an education standpoint, we continually partner with different uh, organizations and subject matter experts to bring you different webinars on a range of different topics that primarily fall within these six thematic areas. Uh, I'd say 99% of our webinars are recorded and uh, there are a few that have restrictions that we're not able to offer on our webinars page but uh please go on to see if uh you you know if you're interested in any of these different topic areas and see what what you might uh, uh, benefit from so uh like for example this time of year we get a lot of questions around what kind of financial supports they might be for family caregivers to tax benefits for example so these are kind of tips that might be available through these webinars that you can go and check out for you uh, uh um prior to doing your taxes as well um, on a more clinical front, we have a program called SCALE, which, which stands for Support for Caregiver Awareness, Learning, and Empowerment. So these are eight psychoeducational webinars that are run by registered nurses and registered social workers. Uh, it's a very structured course that caregivers can sign up for. And um, uh, once they participate in any given week, for example, uh, they have access to either individual or group counseling sessions uh, as part of this scale program. Uh, we run this program live twice a year. Um, this session just finished today was the last session for um, uh, uh, for, for, for this iteration. Uh, we'll have the next one in the fall, but all of these different uh, weeks are recorded and are available on our SCALE website. So if you go onto the word SCALE right on top, I've linked that to the SCALE webpage and you can go and watch the recordings for each of these different uh, weeks as well. Uh, what's unique about this program is that you can sign up for all eight weeks if you'd like, or if you're really interested in week four of session one around 
how caregivers can overcome sadness and guilt, you can sign up for that one session as well. And then uh, participate in the live session for that one and just watch the recordings for the rest of them as well. So yeah, so whatever works for the caregiver is fine by us. Um, I spoke about the Young Caregiver Program. So the Young Caregivers Connect.ca is a program for young caregivers below the age of 25. We primarily work with caregivers 15 to 25. And if there are anyone below the age of 15, we have internal referral mechanisms in place to make sure that they're connected appropriately. Uh, the content of the forums uh, on this webpage are all driven by young caregivers themselves and are not, and we as OCO staff are only involved in the operational side of things. Uh, this is meant to be a safe space for young caregivers to come together and have discussions on what they're experiencing as a young caregiver and find uh, meaningful connections and social circles that can help them through that process as well. We have an e-learning platform um, that you can go to and create a username and ID and access all of these different courses. Uh, the Caregiver 101 course is a really great course to understand uh, what it means to be a caregiver. Uh, and I would really uh, recommend it for new and even seasoned caregivers who might be looking to just kind of get a refresher around uh, caregiving and what that means. Uh, we offer peer supports either uh, through peer support groups that uh, are run throughout the week at different times just based on the availability of uh, our um, peer support uh, facilitators. Uh, and then on a more one-to-one -one level, we have the one-to-one -one peer support program, which connects a caregiver who is looking for that one-to-one -one support with an experienced caregiver who is a peer mentor through OCO, and they kind of meet uh, on a one-to-one -one basis to go through what they may be facing emotionally and uh, help, you know, and then kind of work through that uh, situation uh, again on that one-to-one -one basis. On the face of it, this one-to-one -one program is billed as a telephone-based program, uh, and then really based on the comfort level of the caregiver and the peer mentor, uh, they can switch to a virtual platform like this or I mean, if they happen to be in the same city and if uh, local public health guidelines allow, uh, they can meet at a local coffee shop as well. And then I did mention that we work with system partners across the board. So uh, from the Ontario health teams all the way down to faith-based organizations and um, uh, grassroots organizations as well. We offer different learning opportunities for staff at different agencies around the different tools and resources that they can use to help support caregivers in their workplace. We collaborate with different organizations to be able to offer such sessions like these, for example. And then also if there are organizations that have some sort of caregiver programming, but really want to build and scale those programs, uh, we offer guidance and support on how to do that as well. And then lastly, I talked about how we continually engage with caregivers to hear from them and really learn from their experiences. So caregivers offer insights through various mechanisms, either through participation in our advisory panels, through our different working groups. Um, in research, uh, each year we take out a, what we call a spotlight report that looks at caregiver pain points. So the caregivers kind of help identify those pain points for us. And then there is a different platform called the Caregiver Voices platform, which enables caregivers to go in, uh, create, a, create an account for themselves and participate in a range of different opportunities throughout the province. So it could be someone developing a resource and they are looking for caregivers to provide feedback on that resource, or there might be a research opportunity from a university, for example, so they can go in and uh, participate in that if they like, or they could be a focus group uh, on a range of different topics. Like for example, we've had one around looking at service standards within long-term care and what that means for a caregiver. Uh, so that's something that was a federal call out so we can put that onto this platform so caregivers can sign up if they are interested in that one opportunity. So there is no commitment once you sign up for, uh, for, for this platform, there's no commitment unless uh, you see something that, you, that interests you and then you can click on that and say, yes, I want to participate. So yeah, so if you're a caregiver, I encourage you to uh, go and check out this platform. We not only really have in-house opportunities, but also um, uh, opportunities through system partners as well. And um, feel free to go and subscribe to our newsletters. Um, I know I kind of ran through a lot of information 
if at any point you have any questions and if it's not now, that's okay. Um, my email is on there. Again, my name is Shrid uh, and my email is shridd at ontariocaregiver.ca. Uh, feel free to email me and I will try and get you the answer or connect you with someone who may be able to answer those questions for you. And I'm gonna hand it back to Candice. Thank you so much. Wow, thank you, Shrid. That was um, incredible. There's so many resources available um, in, in small bites if you need that, or you know, you can go incredibly in depth in that um, website that you have with all of those amazing resources. So thank you so much for joining us today and sharing all of these amazing things that are available. Um, we will definitely get the slides from Shred, and I will include all of the resources links that are in uh, those slides also in the description of the YouTube video once we load it up as well. But anyone who has attended tonight will make sure that you get those slides as well because there's so much incredible information in there. So what I can do, Candice, is we have a one pager that kind of summarizes all of those different things with links on them, PDF. Perfect. I can share that as well. And if you just send it out, then all of the things I spoke to is on that one pager. Brilliant, that's fantastic. That will be amazing for everyone. Thank you so much. And I'm hoping uh, you will stick around so that we can have some questions. I'm sure there'll be a lot for you as well. Um, but for now, I'm going to now hand it over to Sadia, and she's going to share a little bit about the resources that are available through the Kidney Foundation. So thank you all so right. much. Thank you. And Shred, that you're, that's amazing, all the tools and resources that you shared. And I see a lot of duplication and a lot of collaboration, I'm hoping, for the future um, through our organizations in terms of supporting caregivers, because it's all about not reinventing the wheel, but supporting where there is support. Um, and I'm all about collaboration. So yeah, I'm excited. So I feel likewise. like- <laughs> Likewise, absolutely. Please reach out and we can have that conversation starting tomorrow. Yeah, oh, for sure. Um, okay, so I'm gonna share a little bit. It's gonna be a little bit similar to um, what has been already been presented. So I'm just gonna quickly share my screen. All right, so, oh, I'm gonna move you guys over here. So at the Kidney Foundation, um, we support not just uh, the caregivers, but we support patients as well. Everyone pretty much going through the kidney journey. Um, and as Shreed said, you know, there's different aspects of caregiving and different individuals going through the caregiving stage um, from different aspects, different cultures, different backgrounds, all of that kind of stuff. So I'll quickly go over it because I see to the time um, and I want to make sure everyone has a really good discussion and can come off camera and, and chat. So a little bit about the Kidney Foundation. Um, so we do offer one-to-one -one peer support as well. Um, it is strictly phone-based um, for safety and confidentiality of our volunteers. Um, our volunteers go through uh, an immense training um, regarding peer support and how to conduct meaningful um, and safe one-to-one uh, -one peer support where they feel comfortable providing it. Um, with tools and tips and, um, like I said, guidance throughout their course of being a volunteer with the Kidney Foundation. Um, when we get a referral, we get it usually from the hospital, from the hospitals that we have built relationships with within the renal world specifically. Um, and that's where we find that match um, according to what the patient or the caregiver, uh, even the living donor, um, the person living through the journey would be asking. Um, our one-to-ones are confidential, um, you know, unless there is harm or some type of self-harm to the person or themselves, that is where we have to bring in, you know, the renal professionals or something like that. So we have total um, safety protocols put in place uh, with us and uh, the individuals providing the, the person to us. Uh, but usually our one-to-ones are over the phone. If the conversation continues on and um, everything goes well, then yes, we allow them to meet in person and be and build that partnership and that friendship, which caregivers definitely need through one another. Um, so we make sure that it is safe, it's liable. We track everything in terms of liability. Um, me as a social worker, I, I really believe that that's really important. So we make sure that all of our caregivers, which we have a few on the call today or this evening, um, provide us, you know, uh, one to one. Uh, feedback and it's 
confidential feedback too. So we don't need to know everything about uh, what goes on, but we make sure that it's safe and that it's provided um, in a safe environment as well. Um, we also have peer support groups. Um, they run monthly. We have, um, they're, at, they're run strictly by volunteers that are caregivers themselves because that is, you know, how we see it should be handled. Um, and again, they're trained, uh, separate training from one-to-one -one and separate training for group facilitation. Um, within our support groups, we do have many. We have over 15 support groups that we provide across Ontario. Um, these are just some of our specialty groups that we provide strictly for these types of, uh, these types of group areas. Um, so we have our Living with Reduced, where caregivers are also welcomed. Uh, where caregivers first learn about their person um, who is diagnosed with kidney disease. So they can join this group and learn how to support their person um, with preventable, preventable tips um, when it comes to diet, when it comes to healthy active living, um, and how they can support and how they can feel supported as an individual um, supporting their loved one. We also have a young adult support group as well. Um, this is for everyone, the patient themselves, the caregiver. Um, we have siblings that join that are caregivers to join to talk to other siblings and caregivers um, or patients on how to support their person within that journey and within that life journey, because we understand that life is a lot different when you're 25, when you're 20, when you're 30, uh, compared to when you're a little bit older. Um, we also have a transplant connect group which is for post-transplant recipients. That's for the caregivers as well and the patient um, because life is a little bit different when you have a transplant. So we wanna make sure that caregivers understand how to support their person through that journey as well. Um, and then specifically, we have our pediatric caregiver group that Kristen herself is one of our amazing facilitators along with others um, where they support that group specifically from the pediatric world. Um, I came from that world, so I understand the importance of how, you know, even my parents as, oops, my parents as immigrants um, needed that support and unfortunately didn't have it. So this group is created to support everyone um, from the languages and everything like that. Um, and then we have our other caregiver group, which is phenomenal. Um, they, they're a large group. And again, they meet once a month and they're just so supportive towards each other and their empathy and their heartfelt stories. You can just tell that it's so meaningful and it, it makes a difference um, with our participants that keep coming back every single month to join um, with our facilitators. So these are all free. We are, again, a charitable organization, so we don't get support from the government. So these are our volunteers working hard to support their population uh, within the caregivers community. So definitely support and reach out to them. Um, they have amazing knowledge and they're fully supported by myself and my colleagues um, who are also patients ourselves. Um, one thing we're cut that's coming up for National Caregivers Month, um, we have a session on um, on Thursday, April the twentieth at one thirty in the afternoon, where it's called Caregiving. Show me the manual. It's hard to be a caregiver, just like Shred had said, and you know we have an amazing social worker, Jose, who's going to be running this session um, and talking about you know, how caregiving is, you know, difficult and it's in unique, unique different situations. He's going to be covering the caregiver bill of, of rights as well in terms of how caregivers are conducted and what supports are offered to them and honestly how they can get supported by other organizations as well along with the Kidney Foundation because again, we're all about collaboration and support. So please check out this, um, this session as well if you're interested you're welcome to email me or even our, our programs uh, email as well. And again, I'll provide that in the chats so that you guys can go ahead and uh, register for that. Um, and just some really quick additional resources that we have for caregivers and patients alike. Um, so being a caregiver, you know, sometimes your main duty is providing meals and cooking. And when, with a renal diet, it's really hard to come up with uh, recipes off the bat. So we have Kidney Community Kitchen, which has uh, recipes that are catered to low sodium, potassium, and phosphate, where caregivers can easily find recipes on there. 
this is also with the dietitians of renal, renal dietitians of Ontario. So there's a blog on there that you can chat with them about simple questions and just get the re support you need when it comes to uh, the diet aspect of it and what to cook, what to, you know, drink, what to make as a, as a snack, that kind of thing. So please check that out. We also have a lot of educational webinars um, that are for everyone, uh, for the caregivers and the patients themselves. Um, really good ones on patient empowerment. We recently had one on mindfulness and breathing techniques when it comes to self-care, because that is so important. Um, and we had webinars with um, the Center for Living Organ Donation with Candice that we also um, have where it's about caregiving. Um, and our amazing caregivers were on that as well. And they give tips and tools. So definitely check those out um, in terms of finding, you know, the right tools for you as a caregiver and where you are at in that caregiving stage. Um, and then lastly, we also have a free exercise program. So this is something that, again, collaboration um, with the Kasman Foundation, um, with the Active Living for Life program. It's a free uh, support where it's for the patient and the caregivers where they can do um, renal friendly exercises while they're sitting down or while they're standing. And we have a registered kinesiologist who is there on camera. It is virtual at the moment uh, that can critique and support your posture, the way you're doing it. Um, just make little tweaks so that you are doing these exercises as safely as you possibly can. So if you're interested, again, um, I'll provide the poster to Candice, but also put the email in the chats. Um, but again, it's free um, and it's a great resource to have and you get backdated videos as well. So that's my presentation. Um, so definitely reach out to us and learn more about the Kidney Foundation in terms of the renal aspect of caregiving. So thank you. Amazing. Thank you, Sadia. And I can uh, echo personally that I actually have used the Kidney Community Kitchen often and I still do. So even when I can't think of a recipe to use or I have a couple ingredients and I want something really new and exciting, I still go to the Kidney Community Kitchen, even post-transplant. So there is incredible resources there. Um, I've also been part of the Active Living group and it's really fantastic. So um, there's so many things that uh, you can check out with the Kidney Foundation. It's a phenomenal organization and I encourage everybody to, to check out all of that. So we will include all of those links as well. Um, we've had some amazing feedback in the chat here um, from people saying thank you, um, which is absolutely beautiful. Thank you to everyone who has been part of it today. I just want to say thank you to each one of you. Thank you so much, Rob, for sharing your journey. Thank you so much, Kristen, for sharing your journey. Shrid for, for providing such amazing resources on probably one of the busiest days for your organization of the year. And Sadia, as well, as always, for sharing the amazing work that the Kidney Foundation does and for co-hosting this with me.